morning, everyone. Uh, you know, thanks again for joining us for the session this morning. It was a privilege to host all of you and to have such an incredible panel with us today. Uh, it was just a, you know the key thing with the session for those who missed it uh, was that QCore, as the nation's leading outcomes research group, uh, is, has always been at the forefront of advocating for patient outcomes in all innovation cardiovascular care. Now that there are discoveries in AI and machine learning on the cusp and, and their varied healthcare applications, we continue to want to be at the center of innovation, at the center of making patient outcomes the key piece in uh, translating these technologies to healthcare applications. So with that, uh, I have a great panel discussion this morning. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Shah. Thanks so much, Rohan. Uh, it was it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, had a wonderful time working with all of you on the session. Um, and so I'll introduce myself for a second. I'm a cardiologist and I was previously on the tenure track at the University of Utah and recently about six months ago transitioned to the tech industry and I'm now a clinical research scientist at Meta Platforms, formerly known as Facebook. Um, and I think my observation from having made this transition is that the free flow of ideas, people, concepts between academia and tech or other industry even is really important to progress. Everybody brings a different set of priorities to the table, but if you can find the intersection of those priorities and influence it, the direction of development based on uh, that set of priorities, you probably end up with a better product in the end. So I think we move away from a linear idea of academia and industry to a more Venn diagram of back and forth, a two-way street um, is gonna be really helpful and foundational in moving the field forward. And a part of that is, uh, I think, creating a, uh, or trying to create a new new opportunities for clinicians. Uh, and my hashtag is hashtag MDs who code. We basically we need a tighter alignment between health sciences broadly and computational sciences, engineering. And I think that's often not available and the, the education doesn't uh, encourage that kind of interaction, but I think it's gonna be really important. And those are really some of the themes I brought to the session today. Perfect, thanks man, I love that, uh, that um, hashtag, MD Sukkot. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Babak who spoke about clinical innovation uh, when we discuss clinical data streams and how do we leverage them using AI and machine learning. Yeah, thanks, Rohan. Yeah, um, it was a, a great session. I, uh, I'm i an assistant professor at Texas A&M, and I'm actually a computer science by background, so I don't have a clinical background. But, you know, some of the things that I started to highlight were exactly the things that were uh, just discussed, that if, um, you know, if you take a bunch of these things out of the box and shift them back and forth between people, you, you get modest gains at best. You know, things don't match properly. People aren't super invested. But if you can, if you can create a tight partnership, you get engineers who really want to understand to some extent the clinical sciences that they're looking at and on the flip side you know clinicians that are that are a little more invested in understanding the methodologies the statistics the biostatistics the machine learning uh then you have an opportunity here to really start to leverage data that you haven't used before to start to understand and explore ranges in which uh clinical outcomes can be further explored both in the short term in more traditional data gathering settings, clinical settings, but as we transition to uh, this new space of understanding personal wearable sensing and data that can be gathered at high frequencies in small frames, uh, you know, how do you start to look at these things longitudinally and really start to track people at an individual level over long periods of time to make sure that their care is improved? And I think there's really an opportunity here with some of the methods that are being created to really understand the sort of dynamic uh, real-time adaptation to uh, understanding what risk really means as as uh, as people progress through their journeys. Uh, thanks, Bobak, for this excellent point. You know, it covers such a key aspect of our discussion. And uh, I'm going to actually hand it over to James Spiricello, who's going to join our discussion for just a brief moment. So, James, uh, whenever he's on. Hey, James. Nice to see hey, you hey. this morning. Nice to see you, too. You know, such an excellent discussion. And uh, thanks for joining. I know you, you have uh, only a moment here. We, we were just recapping our session, as you know, and we discussed, uh, you know, before you, Rashmi and Babak, and, and Rashmi highlighted how important it is to just think about tech and academia as an important, uh, uh, as key stakeholders that work together to develop technology. And then Babak summarized how, how important it is for computer scientists like him to interact uh, you know, at a horizontal level with clinicians and to have a great back and forth with all the right technologies. Um, 
I was going to bring up in your discussion specifically about innovative cardiovascular imaging based technologies. Um, what was your take? I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. I, I think there are a couple key takeaways for me. One is that there is strength in listening to the patients and using their symptoms as a key guide for training your algorithms in a way where just mimicking prior algorithms that were heuristically created doesn't quite capture. Um, and so we have the opportunity to both improve our models and also potentially reduce bias. Um, the flip side is that there's um, well-documented over and over as even when people are thoughtful bias in the models that we build. And so it's impossible to do a good job of this if we're not including key stakeholders uh, at the beginning, like before we acquire data, involving people uh, from minoritized communities in the process of model development. So I think that those are some of the key takeaways. But the other is um, just that we're on the cusp of having this deluge of deep learning based models. And that's good from a certain perspective, but it becomes difficult to deploy. And so I think there's gonna be a challenge and an opportunity for thinking about how do we deploy these models and should it be part of a workflow? Should there be physicians who are dedicated to applying models that are sort of applicable at a systems level um, and which models belong where? I think that that's gonna be a, a discussion that's ongoing um, into the future. It is very well succinctly put. So I, I, this, I know you have to uh, leave now and I'm gonna actually hand over, this is a great point to Xiao Xi, um, uh, for our discussion on how, how we think about implementing technologies that we have developed through our pipeline. Thanks, James. Yeah, so my name is Xiao Xi Yao. I'm an Associate Professor of Health Services Research at Mayo Clinic. So um, what I talk about today is the last step to bring the technologies to patient is Im implementation. And implementing AI and other digital solutions is often more complex than uh, when we adopt a new drug or device. Because when we decide whether we want to use a new treatment in routine practice, the key decision makers are clinicians and their patients. But when we decide whether or not to implement an AI or a health solution, then in addition to the patients and their clinicians, uh, other decision makers such as uh, practice leaders, administrators in IT, are all involved. So before we evaluate and deploy any um, digital tools, we need to carefully consider the implementation strategies and there are certain steps to follow. And this is also a continuous um, work. It's not a one-time task. You need to do continuous learning and improvement. So uh, today we use the example of um, our trial, our pragmatic trial to evaluate and implement an AI in routine practice. So we describe how we did the implementation work before uh, the trial, how we did the modification during the trial, and how we continue um, further improve our implementation strategies um, based on the lessons we learned. Excellent. That's an excellent summary. And for those folks who haven't uh, read the study, this is a nature medicine study led by Yao, uh, uh, Dr. Yao that focuses on how do we detect LV systolic dysfunction using electrocardiographic uh, signals. Um, with that, I would turn it over to Annie, who, who's uh, you know graciously joined us from the FDA, uh, uh, because you know this this perspective that now we've developed the technology, we've done, we created the right team, developed the technology, and have uh, done our job as academics to reach the end goal of. Uh, creating implementation science pipelines. How do we ensure our patients are safe? How do we regulate these devices and and it's to, and ensure fairness? Uh, with that, I would sort of hand it over to Annie. Thanks, Rohan, and uh, it's been a great session, and uh, I really appreciate all of the uh, panelists' uh, great discussion. Uh, certainly, from a regulatory perspective, it's it is a challenge when you're looking at digital health and digital health technologies, whether it's AI, ML, or other types of wearable devices because uh, that learning keeps happening over time. And so we as regulators have to figure out how can we sort of stay on top of it while still ensuring both innovation and safety and effectiveness at the same time. And also thinking about that health equity aspect, especially with 
um, AI ML algorithms and thinking about sort of back to, as you've heard from some of the other panelists, thinking about upfront, how do you have those diverse teams who are really ensuring that the data sets and the testing and the training of the models are going to be uh, representative of the patient population uh, that you're ultimately studying and then implementing in the healthcare systems and that the technologies are actually working in some way that are going to be useful to um, clinicians, to patients, or ultimately improving patient outcomes. And uh, from our regulatory perspective, we're really thinking about how do we assess the technologies and understand that they are actually working uh, in those right populations and how are, can we ensure that people understand what does that mean uh, and what pa patient populations it was trained on, what, um, you know, where does it work, where doesn't it work, uh, and really understanding and ensuring that um, we can ensure that the technologies actually work uh, in different patients and that clinicians actually can use it in their workflow. And I think that's an important piece too, is that it's being designed in a way that it fits into uh, the workflow. And it's not just some add-on like nice thing to have, but it's really actually being useful and it fits into um, sort of the day-to-day -day care of patients. Thanks for that. Um, I absolutely agree with the points. I think the key aspect for our session uh, was highlighting this, this nuance that goes from development to thinking about technology from a, as a team, thinking about implementation, but then not losing sight of the patient. And I'm glad I was able to join you all this morning and I'm, I'm really appreciative of the excellent discussion we were able to have as a group. Thanks so much.